Hi, I'm Kinkas and I'm a synth DIY guy. After I did the Swamp and the Multimode VCF reviews for Erica Synths, I told my friends from Riga that I'd gladly review any more kits they might have. I did not expect them to send me a box with 10 of them all at once. I was pleasantly surprised but also a bit overwhelmed when I opened the box with their complete DIY module bundle number 2. Holy shit! <laughs> The bundle is a Polyvox inspired 84 HP system with two VCOs, two envelope generators, a dual VCA, a noise and modulation source, a MIDI to CV converter and an output module. I decided to start with one of the oscillators as I'd been wanting an analog VCO in my system for a while. I'm actually making these videos after having built the entire set. I now have a good grasp of the Erica Synth's style of design for DIY. I have developed a procedure with logical steps which pretty much works for all the modules. I'll include a PDF with these steps in the video description for quick reference. I also recommend a particular order for building these, especially if you're a beginner. Don't start with the VCO, as it's one of the more complex builds in the bundle. You should start with the envelope generators, the mixer and the filter, which are very easy single board designs. Then the output module, the modulator and the VCA and finally the MIDI to CV and the VCOs. I really like the Erica Synth's philosophy, which is evident in their design priorities. One is the beautiful ergonomic and playable panels, with large knobs for the most important functions. It's a really fun system to play, even without a sequencer or a keyboard, just turning the nice large knobs. Another aspect is that they are all skiff-friendly modules, easily mountable in very shallow racks or skiffs. This means the PCBs are necessarily sandwiched together and components are very tightly spaced. Many of the resistors are placed standing up TP style and the pads are often very small. A word of warning, considering the tight placement, the small pads and the vertical resistors, correcting mistakes can become quite difficult and you can easily rip out pads and break traces, making troubleshooting very complex and time consuming. So my advice is, do not make mistakes. Try to be very meticulous and thorough. Don't confuse values like 4.7k with 47k or a 100 ohm with 100k. Mind the orientation of all the ICs as well as the capacitor and diode polarities. Carefully check the transistors and regulators and make sure they're in their correct spots and oriented correctly. Take your time, focus, triple check everything before soldering and you should be fine. Step 1 is to read the manual and print out the component placement PDF files for each PCB you build one at a time. Have this printout clearly visible in front of you at all times. You may choose to measure and label the resistors ahead of time too. Then start placing and soldering the diodes, ferrite beads and resistors that go flat against the surface. Hold off on the TP resistors for now. Place and solder the IC sockets then the small ceramic and film capacitors, followed by the vertical TP style resistors and the transistors. Often the transistors come with their leads in line and spread apart, but the pads on the boards are close together and form a triangle shape. It helps to flatten out the kinks and bring the legs together on each transistor before placing them on the board. Then add the headers and the electrolytic capacitors, paying close attention to their polarity. Negative is marked with a line on the silk screen. Sometimes these capacitors get pressed down horizontally against the board so they'll fit between boards. Pay attention to that. Same goes for the resettable fuses. They usually get bent down flat against the board. For the headers, it helps to use both boards together to line them up and make sure they're straight and everything will fit. Place the panel components without soldering them Mount the panel to make sure everything lines up and then solder. On this VCO there's an octave switch which needs to have its positioning tab clipped. You also need to place the included small plastic square underneath it to correct for height. Don't forget the mounting screws and spacer to hold both boards together firmly. Finally place the panel back on, tighten all the nuts and place and tighten the control knobs. Check the power pins for shorts using your multimeter. There are also multiple checkpoints on the board. This is step 7 on the user manual. If everything checks out, go ahead and plug it in. Once it's plugged in, check to see if you're getting sound out of the three outputs and if it reacts to the octave switch, the pitch knob and the CV inputs. Calibration is fairly straightforward. The trim pots are conveniently available right from the front panel. 
The top one is the scale adjustment and the bottom one is for the octaves. Just follow the detailed instructions in the user manual and you should have no problem getting it to track very well across many octaves. Fine tuning with the tune knob can be a bit fiddly because it covers a lot of range, making small adjustments difficult. But this is so you have a lot of range available right on the knob, which is great for playing experimentally without an external controller, so it's well worth it. Now let's check these out in action. First we'll have a look at the waveforms. Here's the triangle. Now the saw. And the square with pulse width modulation. And finally, let's have fun with both my Eric oscillators modulating each other in FM.
That's it, thanks for watching, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Next week we'll take a look at the envelope generators, the filter and the mixer. See you soon and stay noisy.